Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Jeremiah. We've had some very interesting things happening in the book of Jeremiah. This particular lesson is number 11 in that series, and it's on the covenant, or some of us would traditionally we have said the covenants, for December 12 of 2015. Before we actually jump into that discussion, let's pray together and ask God to guide us in our thinking. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we now talk about the, the, the details of the relationship that we can have with you and how it might affect us each one, may we understand it clearly, may it be cemented in our minds as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, down through the generations, God has talked about having a relationship with the human family. From the days of Adam all the way to the days of Paul, as far as the Bible is concerned, and now down to our day, even applying to us. Um, we sometimes talk about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the First Covenant, the Second Covenant. We'll give some more details about that as we work along. But basically, really, it's only one thing, and that's God's plan to reestablish a relationship with the human race so that he can take some home to live with him forever. And what is that relationship based on? Love. Love and the faith. traditional word we use is faith, isn't it? In order to understand the role of faith in our salvation, we must clearly understand what faith is. Now, traditionally, I'm not, I don't have time to do this right now, traditionally, if you've asked a pastor what faith is, the usual response is to go to Hebrews 11.1. 1. And the King James says, says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And in actual fact, that verse tells us not what faith is, but what faith does. So I'm going to skip that today. I'm going to take you to a more modern translation. This one, or, or, or not translation, a more modern definition of faith. This one was put together by Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, who was a famous professor, a very popular professor at Loma Linda University for many years. And he says it like this, putting together many things from many parts of Scripture. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. Now, he doesn't say will be. Why does he say may be? Satan knew God very well. Lucifer knew God very well, and he still was able to exercise his freedom to rebel, wasn't he? And all the angels who, who joined him. Well, faith implies an attitude toward God of love, <clears throat> trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God, based on the more than adequate evidence revealed, to be willing to believe what he says, as soon as we are sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers, as soon as we are sure he's the one offering it, and to do what he wishes, as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for salvation. How many requirements are there for salvation? Only one. Faith. That kind of faith. Faith also means that, like Abraham and Moses, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Now, any questions about that definition of faith? When did Abraham ask why and when did Moses ask why? In Genesis 18, <coughs> Moses is walking out with, with Christ himself to the edge of the escarpment and looking down at Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's saying, why do you have to destroy these cities? If there are 50, will you save it? If there are 40, 30, 20, 10? So that's Genesis 18. And Moses was Moses as, asking why when God said to him several times, in the books of, especially the book of, well, Exodus and in Exodus 34, 32, 
and then up to 34. And then in Numbers, two or three times, God says, step aside, Moses, just let me destroy these people and I'll make a great nation out of you. And, and, and Moses said, no, God, wait, wait, hold. why are you angry with your people? You know they're terrible sinners, but if necessary, wipe me out of your book and, and just save them. These are your children. I mean, what would the Egyptians say? See? Moses, and Moses showed. I mean, why do you think God took him to heaven three days after he died? Moses was, both Abraham and Moses were very concerned, not about what was going to happen to them, but about God's reputation. And that's what we need to think about. Well, almost every Christian knows about the greatest example of faith in the scriptures, and that is? It says Abraham. Abraham. And where does that idea come from? Remember the verse? Genesis 15, verse 6. Maybe we should look at that just really quickly. Genesis 15, verse 6. Um, oh boy hold on my Bible went to something I didn't want and is it 15 Abraham put his trust in the Lord that's another trust is another word for faith and because of this the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him okay so faith means if we really have faith in God he is pleased with us and he will save us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and there's, there, there are Bible references to this. Galatians 3, 6, 9 is a very familiar passage. Consider the experience of Abraham. As the scripture says, he believed God. That's the same word. Believe, trust, faith, confidence. He believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham, through you God will bless the whole human race. Abraham believed and was blessed. So all who believe are blessed as he was. But there's another verse that um, doesn't appear in the Bible study guide that we need to read alongside that, I think, and that's found in James chapter 2, starting with verse 18. But someone will say, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there's only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. You fool. Do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. And so forth. Hmm. Are Paul and James arguing with each other? They're making a point. <laughs> okay, what, yeah. what's the point they're making? That, what, what? well, that just believing and not doing, because believing is an action word. You believe and you do the things that correspond with the belief. Okay. Um, Someone has said, and I think very rightly so, faith works. Mm -hmm. In other words, your relationship with God, if, if it's a really meaningful relationship like the faith we talked about up above, if you have that kind of a relationship with God, it impacts you. It affects your life. It affects everything about you. So, in this lesson, we're going to talk about the Abrahamic covenant. I'm sorry, we're going to talk about Adam's covenant. Genesis 3.15, I will make you and the woman hate each other, and her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, but you will bite her offspring's heel. Okay? And this is, of course, talking to the, to the serpent. And so, what is God saying to, the, to Adam and Eve there at that point? And not too complicated, is it? He says, you're going to crush the devil, Right? going to crush his head. The Lord said to Abraham, I leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home. Go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants. 
and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. Now that's the Abrahamic covenant. Do you see any relationship between that one and, and the one to Adam? Well, what about the one on Mount Sinai? Is that different? Look at Exodus 19.8. Now this is before the giving of the Ten Commandments. And all the people answered together, We will do everything that the Lord has said. And then in, in, in Exodus 24, God, Moses comes down, now he's written it out, reads it to them, talks to them about it, and what do they say? Twice, we will do everything the Lord has said. And what happened 40 days later? Dancing around an yeah, idol. Dancing cow, around drunk cows. and naked around a golden calf. Well, and then there's a new covenant, and I'm not going to read that one right now. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. But they didn't say how long they would do everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, not long enough. <clears throat> so we need to be clear on several points in these covenants. One, there's no way human beings can earn their own salvation. Isn't that pretty clear? Yes. Two, God's salvation is a gift, a gift which he gives freely to those who trust him enough to let him be the most important thing in their lives. Well, but don't you earn this by trusting? Okay. Did, uh, you've been married. Did, did you manage to earn your wife's trust? How did you earn it? I'm not quite sure why in the world she fixated on me to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been amazed at that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Amazing Jay. <laughs> yeah, amazing Jay. Sometimes I think she should have, uh, never mind. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Three, to those who understand clearly God's instructions and their implications, it becomes a wonderful gift because they realize that God never asks us to do anything which is not for our best good. Now that is a very hard lesson for people to learn. Now if you stop and ask, about it, ask them about it philosophically and they, they're sitting down quietly and thinking about it, they'll probably say, yeah, that's right. But when it comes time to be tempted, what happens? Well, well, I, can, would, I wouldn't be surprised if Jeremiah asked that question several times. Yeah. Just, you know, is this really for my good down here in this that, mud yeah. hole? In, in you know? uh, James uh, chapter 1, verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Yes. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. You know? Okay. Last, last broadcast, we, we mentioned, uh, as we have from time to time in here, about the Jews doing World War I and the Holocaust. How could it be very difficult for them to say, it would be very difficult for me to say, well, this is all for my benefit. Yeah. And even after <coughs> the experience, maybe if I were Jewish and had gone through it, maybe I could see how it was for me. But... It's very difficult to look at something like that and say, you know, this is really for my benefit. And uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, but hold on just a minute. That's not really what it says. It does, the thing isn't saying, okay, when something terrible happens to you, that's for your benefit. What, it's the, what God says is, if you obey, obey me, you will see that it has its benefits. <laughs> I'm not sure that <laughs> helps my previous comment any, but... Many times God is re described as a, your protector. Mm -hmm. And if you step away from his protection mm -hmm. and bent on leaving and not taking instruction, all through the Old Testament he's complaining you don't listen, you don't take instruction. What can he do? Yeah. You're bent on leaving, he'll honor your choice. So let's, let's be very specific. What is the major difference between the first covenant, that one we read about in Exodus 19, and the second covenant? Let's, let's read that one now, Jeremiah 31. The Lord says the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. 
So it's pretty clear which covenant he was talking about is the old covenant, isn't it? Um, Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I, who's speaking? God. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins. I will no longer remember the wrongs I, the Lord, have spoken. We can go back even farther in Exodus, oh, yeah. clear back to Exodus 6, uh, 6 and following. Mm -hmm. And he says, I will take you for my people. I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has yeah. brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Yeah. I said, but the people didn't listen because they're cruel condition. This is often interpreted to be that, well, the old covenant, the new covenant is really the good one. And the old covenant <clears throat> was filled with flaws. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what were the flaws? Well, I, that, ooh, that, ooh. that's a, that's a, that's a, well. Well, l l let me just make a suggestion. Who is doing the yeah, promising yeah, yeah. in the first, in the old covenant? People say everything we, you say will do. Three times they said, even before they heard what <coughs> God had to say, they said, oh, just tell us what you want us to do. God will do it. And well, then you get up to Joshua one one. Oh yeah. And he said, just as we obeyed Moses in all things, we'll 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 obey you. But and if anybody steps out of line, kill them. <laughs> what's wrong? If you got people thinking in that term, how can you communicate to them? What what what's what's wrong with that kind of a covenant? What saying you know whatever you whatever you want us to do, Lord. Well, you tell we'll, me. You know, want you to shut you up. know enough of the you know enough of the history to know what's wrong with that kind of covenant. What's wrong with it? Well, it sounds like a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's just a good because, idea. I'm, I'm just not arguing. Because, just because they are, they have, it, 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 they, you? it was right, right, I'm sure it's here in Maxwell's thing, they did it with it, with an earnest heart. They were wanting to, they were thinking they were going to trust. They were, had faith in all of this. Um, they didn't want to listen anymore. They, they wanted to go do their own thing. All the complaints, God, yeah. you don't listen, you don't take instruction. That's, that's all. He says, I will heal you. And they go on and make a promise and go on turn their back. Well, so I mean, that's the old covenant? Yes. The, the what old. about that covenant clear back in, in Genesis that we, that we started out with? Well, I mean, are we talking about the Abraham or the Adam one? Well, both of them. Okay, the Adam one is God speaking to Lucifer in the form of a serpent. And he's, what does he say? I will crush your head, or they will crush your head, and you will bite their heel. Okay? Who's well, promising? That, that's a promise to, to Adam and Eve. As, yeah, but who's as making what? the promise? Well, God is. Okay, so who's the one that makes reliable promises? God. Yeah. Well, somehow that... <laughs> And we well, come but to, God, we come to the I Abraham. Mean, that's a disadvantage. God can't do anything wrong. We can. So just because we made a good promise but can't get love it doesn't mean that it's not a good covenant. It's well, a bad let's, covenant. Well, let's see. Should I rely on the people who can't be trusted or should I rely on the people who can be? Well, he, I mean, he has to rely on people who can't be trusted. When oh. he came down here and put Jesus in the care of Mary and Joseph, uh, they, they goofed up some. and. Yeah. If he's, if he's going to put any trust in humans, yeah. it's going to be in people who can't. They can be trusted to do the wrong thing. Okay. <laughs> That's what we don't. Is. One thing you can depend upon, human nature is undependable. Right. <laughs> Down through the ages. Not only that, one, th one of the things you learn from history is that we don't learn anything from history. Right. Yeah. So what you're saying here is with this new covenant, what we would be saying here is that the old covenant was made by humans. How can you have, you can't have a covenant unless the other party agrees. Yeah. Well, do you think God would, would say, no, I don't agree when you, when you say you're going to obey me? Well, may, we're saying, we're implying here that he should have. He should have, <laughs> he should have said, look, there's no way you're going to do this. We'd better. He, he said that later. <laughs> it's a little late then. 
<laughs> uh, look at the Noah covenant. What happened to Noah? God protected Noah. He protected him during the flood, and, and when it was over, what happened? Noah went back to do a lot of the things they were doing before, offering sacrifices. Look at Genesis 9, verse 8. God said to Noah and his sons, I am now making my covenant with you and with your descendants, and with all living beings, all birds and all animals, everything that came out of the boat with you. With these words I make my covenant with you, I promise that never again will all living things be destroyed by a flood, never again will a flood destroy the earth. Okay, as a sign of this everlasting covenant which I am making with you and with all living beings, I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be the sign of my covenant with the world. No promise about fire, but don't have to worry right. about floods. He, he, told, he told us about fire, too. <laughs> okay. So, what, what, what's with that? Who, who's doing the promising? Did it work? A short time later, they were building the Tower of Babel, weren't they? Yeah. Well, they were, but God's promise is still good. Right. Yeah. God had, now I'm reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 91. God had given men his commandments as a rule of life. But his law was transgressed, and every conceivable sin was the result. The wickedness of men was open and daring. Justice was trampled in the dust, and the cries of the oppressed reached unto heaven. Okay? Do you think, in passing here, we're going to talk maybe a little bit more about this later, but do you think that the people who lived before the flood were any more wicked than we are now? The whole world, if you take the whole world? They sound more barbaric, but I don't know if they were more wicked, but they sound bar really barbaric. I think more creative. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were any the less, and, uh, uh, and when you think of it, their brain power had to be better than anything we've got these days, mm -hmm. so far back. As it were in the days of Noah, so will it be in the time in the coming of the Son of Man, Matthew yep. 24, 37. Yep. So is that... <coughs> 38, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Mm -hmm. So now is that, um, is that coming, <clears throat> it'll be that evil when he comes? Is that when he came 2,000 years ago or is that oh, no, when he comes? Be that they were pretty pious. Well, it can't be the 2,000 years ago, but because Jesus is at the end of that experience already when he's saying, when, he, when I come back, so he's not talking about 2,000 years ago. Okay. Well, what about God's covenant? Does he, do, does he pour out his reign on the, on the good people and the bad people? Yes. He made his covenant with who? The whole world. Okay. Matthew 5, 45, and my reign will pour on the good and on the bad, right? Well, should God have maybe put more conditions on Abraham? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, on Noah and his family. You've got to obey me, otherwise I won't, won't give you rain. Should he have done that? I'm asking some tough questions, I understand. Well, I, I was thinking, he, he does what you just read, the good and the bad get it. I can think of one or two instances when I was a lad. There was a farmer, an Adventist farmer, who was a prosperous farmer. Uh, I won't go into the whole background, obviously, but he, God saved his wheat crops when they were at their prime, when bushfires broke out, when his neighbors got cleaned out. Yeah. I can tell you about a case of a school, an Adventist school in northeastern Tanzania. And it was, it was a drought year, really, really dry that year. And the, the man who was in charge up there said, you know, usually what they do is they waited until there was a, a good rain and then they would plant. And he said, you know, w the only people we have to work our fields are the students. And here's when they start school and here's when the school ends and we have to, they have, if we don't harvest it when, when they're here, we're not going to be able to harvest our crops. So he did his calculation. He knew all this as an expert, an agricultural expert from the United States who was there and, and doing all this. He said, okay, even though it looks crazy, we're going out into those dry fields and we're going to plant our, our corn right now. Mm 
and the students thought he was crazy, but mm -hmm. they went out and they planted because he told them to. The next day it started pouring rain. Mm -hmm. It rained for about two days, and everybody else was getting their corn ready, then it stopped. Mm -hmm. And everybody else's corn just dried out on the ground. And his, their, their corn managed to sprout up a little bit, and then it looked like it was going to die because it was so dry for a long period of time. And then just as they thought it was going to dry, whoosh, the rain hit again. And they were the only people in that whole area who got a good crop that year. Yeah, it happens. My uh, wife was sharing with, with me last week. Um, there was a big fire in Northern California. And what town is that behind? Middletown. 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 Yeah, yeah. There's a Seventh-day Adventist church there. And as the fire was passing through, it was destroying all the homes and the cars and everything. And it burned completely around the perimeter of the Adventist church and then kept going. And all the other homes around it are all burned down. And the footage of it is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, well. Well, we've already talked about the covenant that God said he wanted to have with Abraham. What, what did God ask Abraham to do in exchange for his promises to him? What was Abraham supposed to do and what was God promising? Do you remember? He wanted him to leave the country he was used to and go to a country he'd be shown. Okay, that was the first, first step. What else? What came next? To sacrifice his own son. Yeah. Okay, that was at the end. Okay, any other things? He was asked to circumcise himself and all of his, all the men in the family. What, Edna, what did you say? Circumcision. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Wait for his wife. Be faithful. I'm going to give you a son by Sarah. How much faith does it take to wait for a 90-year-old woman to give birth? <laughs> Had done nothing against your gender, but you know, <laughs> things are looking a little grim at that point, right? And then he's asked to sacrifice that son of the promise. I mean, it was a miracle child. He was a miracle child. There's, there's no other way you can get around it. And he was also promised that that son would be the ancestor of who? Christ. The Messiah. Christ. Well, here's a comment from our Bible study guide. See what you think about these words. Abraham was no more saved by works than the thief on the cross was. Even though James seems to say that he was. It's always and only God's saving grace that brings salvation. Abraham fulfilled his end of the covenant promise. His obedience revealed the faith that took hold of the promise of salvation. His works didn't justify him. Instead, the works showed that he was already justified. That's the essence of the covenant and how it is expressed in the life of faith. Okay? So what does that mean? Some people may do works but their heart, their intent is not right. So I don't think all works classify the same kind of way. Yeah. So let me see if I can save that in other words. Please. People who have the right kind of relationship with God will do the right kind of things. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah. Well, considering the definition of faith that we looked at earlier, is it clear why faith is the only requirement for salvation. What do we say? Who is it that God can save? People he trusts. Well, and why does he trust them? Because they have a relationship. They have a relationship, and he knows that when he takes them to heaven, they're not going to start the great controversy all over again. God can't take a bunch of people to heaven that are just going to perpetuate what's going on here on the earth, right? So, yeah, well, that's a that's a terror. And, and the idea of evangelical Christians to say someone is safe to save is like pure heresy. You know, because God does it for us. There's nothing we do. There's nothing about our relationship that has anything to do with saving him. No, saving us. Well, in what sense is it that God does everything and we do essentially nothing? Is there some sense in which that's true? Did God, did God win the great controversy all by himself? 
Any of you help God win the great controversy? No. Really. Well, we showed what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> showed him what not to do. Well, he offers us the benefits of that victory if we will trust him. He shows him, he shows us through the life and death of Christ, okay, this is the kind of life if you want to be like me, if you want to trust me and so forth like this, and this is what happens if you don't. I mean, is that a choice or what? Do we, ta do we want to take that seriously? Well, how do, we, how do we actually accomplish that? I guess that's the next question. Do I just say, I'm going to do this? Does that work? No. 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 So how does it happen? We're not sure? <laughs> well, we need God's help. We need a relationship with Him. Otherwise, it's All not on. God is able and willing to remake us step by step into His image, if we allow Him. We cannot do that ourselves. We can only allow Him the opportunity to do it as we study our Bibles, pray and practice witnessing, or teaching others about Him. How, uh... Yeah? How independent are we versus how tethered are we? Are we, does this, the capacity to enjoy this everlasting opportunity, mm -hmm. is that <clears throat> because we are tethered to him or because let me we know. we have a certain power um, bestowed upon us with a great deal of uh, independence. Is okay. that making any? Okay. I, get it. I guess I'm, I'm I'm trying to figure out how, just how really closely tethered we are, or how closely okay. independent we. Are. Let me ask a question. Not too long ago, you bought I think a new car. Do you think it's a good idea to follow the directions in the handbook in the car? Well, they tell me to take it to the dealer to have all the repairs made, and I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's not one of the really important things that it says. You put oil in it, and you put gas but in I, the right but place. I, I, when they say it? put gas in instead of sugar, I, th you, I think that's a good idea. You think that's a good idea. Very good. Okay. So, I mean, if we... I mean. And this is a, it's easy to say, but it's hard to actually do. But don't we believe that, at least philosophically, we, don't we believe that everything God asks us to do is really for our best good? Yes. Yes. I do. Theoretically. Yeah, but are we, are we able to do that without a very strong tether? Well, he offers us the help. How much help do you need? I'll give you all the help you need. That's what God says. No, you don't have to take it. Well, how much help did Adam need? Well, before, not as much before, as I need. <laughs> be before the fall. Yeah. How, how, how closely did he need to be? I mean, well, tethered, and we'd always say, but. How, how, you know, how? Well, here's, look at a verse. Let's take verses from the Bible. They were fairly reliable. Hebrews 4, 2. For we have heard the good news, the gospel, just as they did. He's talking about the people in Moses and Joshua's day. They heard the message, but it did them no good because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. What do those words mean? If we say that faith is a word to describe a relationship with God, what we're saying is they didn't succeed because they didn't have a relationship with God, right? And they didn't trust the word. And they didn't trust him. When he said, I mean, you know, by the time we get down to Jeremiah's time, we're talking about now, we're going to find out in the last couple of lessons in this series, it, Everything that God called them to do, they said, we won't do that. We're going to do just the opposite. I mean, what do you do when people respond like that? 
If I have lots of faith, why do I need grace? Well, I mean, that's a self-contradictory question. The reason you have faith is grace. the reason you have grace. faith is because there is grace. If God hadn't revealed Himself to you, that's His grace. What would you know about Him? Nothing, nothing at all. So, faith is your response, or should be your response to His grace, if you choose to call it that. I I, I like to call it the evidence about His life and His death. Um, faith is based on evidence. That's what Jesus. Read the chapter on it is finished in Desire of Ages. Jesus, when he was on the cross there, he relied on the evidence heretofore given him by the Father. and said, I can't see to this tomb. I can't see how this could possibly work out right, God. It seems to me that I'm about to die and I'm going to be separated from you forever. But in the past you told me thus and so, and I choose to trust what you told me in the past. Do I get any power with this, with this faith and with this, with this grace? Is there any power? Yes. Well, the Holy Spirit, man, how much power do you need? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell others about your relationship with God. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Is there power available that I'm supposed to tap God in will... and implement and use? God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. Well, I'm not talking about temptation. I'm talking about well, power to resist doing, temptation. Doing, doing things I, maybe I should be doing. You want to move some mountains, and what do you want to do? Oh well, yeah, move a few mountains. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you ever had the experience of reading something, either in the Bible or in Ellen White, and you say, man, that's exciting. I, I, I believe that God... I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. And then you find yourself failing. Do we ever do that? What about, um, what about, um, what am I trying to say here? What am I, I don't want dead air time here, but, um, I know, I guess I sometimes think that, uh, well, when it comes to sin, we, we hear, we hear preach that <clears throat> it doesn't make any difference what you have done in the past, God has the power to, um, to take care of that. What about Ezekiel 18? Yeah. It says, just stop doing the bad stuff and you'll, you'll save yourself. Well, well, and we don't even have to go to Ezekiel, although that's a well, very it's, good it's, passage. I'm not arguing with that. It's a great... But, but right here, our, our main passage we're studying for today. Look at verse 34. None of them will have to teach his fellow yeah. citizen to know the Lord. Okay? Why not? Because all will know me. To know God is to love him. Now, it's not that I added that part. From the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins. What do you need? and I will no longer remember their wrongs. What does that mean? I will no longer remember well, I, their wrongs. I understand. What, what does that mean? Because I'm going to bring it up again to you. It just, it's, it's, it's in the past and you're not worried about it. The sins you've done in the past, they're all solved. But it's the sins I'm about to How do. How are they solved? <laughs> sins I'm about to do. I would like some power <laughs> with that. Yeah. Okay. I, want, I don't want to do that. And okay. it seems like here's, here's, we always hear that oh, there's plenty of power to take care of the I'm, sins I'm you've done. I'm but, control. but I'm going to tell you <laughs> words that are the answer to your question, not my words, <clears throat> other people, Bible's words, and so forth. Two, three things. First of all, the reason God says there's nothing wrong with God's memory. He, he's not forgetting things. He understands everything. He hasn't forgotten anything. He knows it perfectly well. I could give you quotations to, to prove that. So when he says, I will no longer remember your wrongs, why does he say that? He says that because if we have that kind of faith relationship with him, which causes our life to be changed, those sins no longer describe us. We're not that person we were before. We have been changed. Yeah, but I know just around the corner. Okay. And here's, here's the answer to that one. Sin can on, cannot be stamped out. It can only be crowded out. 
The only way you can deal with the sins around the corner is to fill your life full of good things so there's not room for the bad things. And the Holy Spirit will guide you through that step by step. Um, Great Controversy, page 555, is one of the famous passages. By beholding, we become changed. If we fill our lives full of reading the Bible, full of thinking about Jesus, so Ellen White says that we, it would be good to spend a thoughtful hour every day studying the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. If we would fill our minds full of that kind of stuff, he'll take care of the rest. So, with this grace comes the power to solve the sins of the past and the power to control the sins. Okay. Um, I'm going I'm to interrupt for a second. <laughs> there's, there's not even God can change the past. He just says, forget what happens in the past. Look forward. Look to Jesus and move forward. If you made a mistake in the past, let's forget that. That's exactly why he says, I won't remember them anymore. He says, forget about them. I know you're... We, I mean, the Bible is very clear. We're all sinners. Do I need to repeat 25 texts that say we're all sinners? There's, so... God says, don't focus on that because if you focus on your past sins, what's going to happen? You're going to keep doing them. So he says, forget about those past sins. Look to me. Give the Holy Spirit a chance and move forward. I don't, I don't know how to say it any straighter than that. And God just said to them many, many, many times, if you'll just be my people, I will be your God. Here's what Ellen White says about that experience. The same law that was graved, remember in, in Jeremiah 31, it says he would write his law where? In their, hearts. in their hearts. Here she says, the same law that was graved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. Now, does that mean he's in there with some kind of scratching thing writing in the left ventricle? No. Instead of going about to establish our own righteousness, so many people want to do that, we accept the righteousness of Christ. How do we do that? How do we accept the righteousness of Christ? This is not somebody doing something in a bunch of books up in heaven. This is saying, I want to be more like you, Jesus. Okay, let's practice. I want to be more like you. Okay, let's practice. I want to be more like you. Okay, let's practice. We keep practicing, we keep practicing, and the Holy Spirit gives us guidance and we're changed. She goes on to say, His blood atones for our sins. His obedience is accepted for us. Then the heart renewed by the Holy Spirit will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Through the grace of Christ, we talked about grace, we shall live in obedience to the law of God written upon our hearts. Having the Spirit of Christ, we shall walk even as He walked. Patriarchs and Prophets, 372, paragraph 2. So, I wish he used that term, his blood atones for our sins. I, I think another way to say that is you study his life, you see that everything he did, even clear to the cross, it brings us into a state of conciliation, a state of harmony. As Paul says in Romans 5.10, we are healed, saved it says, but healed by his life. Mm -hmm. Study his life. If you like his life, uh, there is hope. If you don't like it, he can't force it on you, and he will not force it on you. That's the one thing you can count on. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, no question about it. And, I mean, he offers it to you. He, says, he said, look, here, I'm, I answered all the questions in the Great Controversy. I overcame the devil. I defeated him. I proved that everything he says is false. I mean, how much more evidence do you need? Do we believe do we really believe that to know God is to love Him? Well, to know God and Jesus is eternal life. You're looking for eternal life. John 17, verse 3. Exactly. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ whom you sent. So how do we get eternal life? Study Jesus. Study God. Learn about Him. Accept Him as our friend. John 15, 15. I mean, how many places do we need to read? Well, Luke and Paul talked a little bit about the death of Jesus. Look at Luke 22, verse 20. In the same way, 
And now he's talking about the, 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 the Last Supper. In the same way, he gave them the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is God's new covenant. We're talking about covenants here. Sealed with my blood. What, what you can learn about the death of Christ and why he had to die, which is poured out for you. Okay? Then we look at 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord the teaching that I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a piece of bread, gave thanks to God, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. This means that every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death. What does that mean? The purpose of the communion service is for us to think about why Jesus had to die and to think about his kneeling down with a towel around his waist to wash 12 pairs of dirty feet. This is God kneeling down, not just a human being. This is God kneeling down. Do you think the Father would do that? Yes. Because Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father, that, so yes. That I may know him, page 338. I don't have time to read it right now. But that I may know him, page 338. Everything that Jesus did is exactly what the Father would have done if he had come <coughs> in the place of Jesus. Wow. Uh, our yes. No, I said, what a thought. Yeah, mm -hmm. our salvation is linked to the death of Christ because without the answers He gave in the great controversy, no one could be saved. And His love, expressed by His willingness to live and die for us, moves us to want to be like Him. This is not a legal transaction that takes place somewhere in behind a cloud somewhere in heaven, but a real change that takes place in us. God comes down and he says, I, no, this is not us cha transforming ourselves. No, it's God. If you say, God, welcome, I want you in my life, God says, okay, we we'll can form a relationship. And by the way, I call that relationship faith. And if you form that kind of relationship with me, it will transform you. I, I, I do it. I mean, God says to us, he will do that. We don't do it. He does it for us. Well, Christians have a ceremony given to them by Jesus to remind them on a regular basis of this agreement between themselves and God. Jesus himself, the last supper with his disciples, linked this new ceremony with his second coming. Do you remember those verses? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died Believing in Christ will rise to life first. Okay? What about 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 18? Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? Now, remember, there was a big argument about this in the city of Corinth. If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. So, I mean, this all fits together. Do we trust God? Do we believe what he has done for us? Do we believe what he can do in us? If Christ has not been only saved, more than that, we are shown to be lying about God because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to the life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers of Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in the world. Does God have the ability to make a difference in our lives? Yes. And here's a question for you. If God, if Jesus doesn't plan to come back the second time, was there any reason for him to come the first time? I can't imagine what it would be. 
He could just let things go and everybody would kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have any friends. <laughs> no. You wouldn't have to worry about it. No. No. That's why you, he has to be our protector of the good ones. The good folk have to be protected. We don't realize the powers of evil that are out there. Why do you think Jesus promised that he would not eat the unleavened bread or drink the grape juice until he comes, until we sit down with him in his kingdom? Why would he say a thing like that? Does that say anything about what we might be eating and drinking when we get to heaven? No steak. <laughs> I don't remember anything about a steak. Honestly, though, sometimes the way we talk about heaven, it seems, it seems pretty simplistic. And I think there's much more. We're going to see so much more. And because before we're going to sit, do and sit and ask Jesus this, this and that, how long would that take? <laughs> what, what do we do next? You've got the rest of eternity. Dude, there, must to be, there has to be more. Well, I'll just give, you know, it's interesting to talk about your own personal experiences. We have had uh, some very close friends mm -hmm. staying with us for the last few days people we worked with in Africa and they had worked before that in in India and so this young woman said that she's coming to stay in her house so she brought along some things fruits that we had never tried before <laughs> fantastic fruits melons like I have never seen before never seen a melon like that before rambutans some of you know, might know what a rambutan is they're great. We used to have them a long time ago in Africa, but I almost forgotten about them. I mean, God has so many choices available out there that we have no idea about. Mm -hmm. There's not a chance in the world we get bored when we get to heaven. Well, in our modern days, a scientific, a scientific explanation, there are many things that science can explain in great detail which were complete mysteries to our ancestors. Science, for example, can now explain why raindrops produce rainbows. Why do the raindrops produce rainbows? Refraction of light. Yeah. You know, you've all seen the pictures of how, what rainbows look like as they come down to the sky, and the sun shines through that prism. And what happens if you hold a prism up? It, some of the light goes through slower, and some of the light goes through faster, and psh, there it is. It spreads out and makes a rainbow. We can explain that. When you think about that, that, what does that mean? That the air composition must have been different before he did that? No, it means there was no rain before. It doesn't mean the air composition is different. It no, just I was means thinking it, more moisture and stuff. Yeah. It's well, but there's, there can be a lot of moisture in the air without forming raindrops. But you have yeah. to have raindrops. You have to have physical raindrops in order to have a rainbow. True. And the first rains were at the time of the flood. So that's why the, you know. But there are many other things that, ra that science can't, doesn't have a ghost of an answer for. Why did Jesus have to die? What possible explanation can science give for that? How does his death affect each one of us personally? Science has not a clue. How can we know for sure that he's coming back? Science can't help us a bit, just to mention a few things. In light of this lesson, what is the relationship between faith and works? Well, of course, that's a big issue, but big question. But if God, if we allow God to engrave his message on our hearts, which really means in our minds, if we allow him to cement his truths into our minds, it will transform us. Um, let's look at a few verses. Galatians 3. My brothers and sisters, I am going to use an everyday example. When two people agree on a matter and sign an agreement, no one can break it or add anything to it. Now, God made his promises to Abraham and to his descendant. The scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people, but the singular descendant, meaning one person only, namely Christ. What I mean is that God made a covenant with Abraham and promised to keep it. The law, which was given 430 years later, what would that mean? 430 years later, what happened 430 years later? Exodus from Egypt. Yeah, the Sinai, the Exodus, cannot break that covenant and cancel God's promise. For if God's gift depends on His law, on the law, then it no longer depends on His promise. 
However, it was because of his promise that God gave that gift. It was because of his promise that God gave that gift to Abraham. And I wish we had another hour to discuss the next few verses. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is. And it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendants and so forth. And oh boy, when you start saying the law was added, you can, you can stir up a real hornet's nest. We often hear people talk about justification by faith, sanctification by faith, righteousness by faith, even salvation by faith. What is the common factor in all those expressions? Faith, faith. right? Yes. If we maintain that right kind of relationship with God, He will take care of all the details necessary to save us. If we come to regard God as a friend, by developing that faith relationship with Him, He adopts us into His family, and by faith, we become children of Abraham. Justification, <coughs> sanctification, righteousness, and salvation, salvation do not come in any other way. We know that Adventists have been called legalists because of our approach to the laws expressed in the Old Testament. Uh, Today, Seventh-day Adventists still follow those instructions given by Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago. Once every three months, as a part of a communion service, we wash one another's feet. We partake of the unleavened bread and the grape juice. We seek to understand more clearly God's plan for our lives. What does that communion service mean to each one of us? Well, having studied all about covenants now, we're all experts, right? Let's go back to the almost the beginning. How do you understand that statement in Genesis 15, 6? Abraham put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. What does that mean? And could we, today, living in 2015, have an Abraham-like faith by trusting, by coming to trust God as our friend? I think it's possible. I think that's exactly what God has been trying to call us to do for 6,000 years. And he's laid out the evidence in every possible way. The experiences from the Old Testament, the life and death of Jesus. What more could we ask for? He just says, trust me. That's all he asks. Just trust me. Our kind and loving Father, what more could we say in our feeble human way? We tried to work our way through some thorny issues and things that people have argued about and discussed and talked about for centuries. We pray that some of those who are listening might, because of what they've heard, have a clearer picture, and may it be true as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.